So these incidences started about six years ago and went on for a couple of years. I used to be really into the music scene, going to shows and festivals every chance I got. This often meant meeting random people whose names I would forget five seconds later. As a result of being out in Atlanta nightlife so often, I got frequent friend requests on Facebook and naive younger me blindly accepted them, assuming they were just people I had met at shows that I was too distracted to remember. One day, I got a message from someone named Eddie. His Facebook profile picture was of someone at least a decade older than me with long scraggly hair. He looked harmless enough, just another show-going hippie I assumed. His message simply asked if I was the girl that danced a half circle around him at the local show last night and then twirled dreamily away, or something along those lines. This is back in 2012, so I don't remember the exact words. I responded that I had no recollection of that and, upon further investigation, saw that he lived in an entirely different state, so it couldn't have been me. He said that I must have had a doppelganger out there somewhere and I left the conversation at that. Over the next few months, I'd get random notifications that he had messaged me, asking if I'd be at a various shows across the southeast. I mostly ignored the messages, but would very occasionally respond, shortly expressing interest in a band he had mentioned, just trying to be polite. Why younger me felt the need to be polite to everyone is beyond me. I have since learned that it's okay not to respond to persistent internet strangers. The messages became more and more frequent, so I just started to leave them unread. Again, why I didn't block him is beyond me. I guess I thought he was just harmless and lonely. Fast forward about a year. It's summer of 2013, and two of my best friends and I are caravanning to Wakarusa, a music festival that took place in Ozark, Arkansas. It was about a 13-hour drive from Atlanta, but totally worth it. We went every year. An important note here is that this wasn't some small, intimate festival. It hosted upwards of 40,000 people, and it was often hard to keep track of my friends, let alone find people I knew who came separately. So my friends and I are on a blanket in the middle of a huge crowd, watching widespread panic. It's nighttime, so the only lights are coming from the stage, random LED toy or glow sticks or whatever. Out of nowhere, someone beelines for our blanket makes himself at home next to me without permission, and strikes up a conversation. My group of friends are generally warm and accepting, and it wasn't unusual to make random friends at a big hippie fest like this, so we thought nothing of it at first, probably just someone high on something and looking for company. It wasn't until we started referencing me, my Facebook personally, that the alarm bells started going off. This was Eddie. I had honestly completely forgotten about him and his persistent messages, and in the darkness there was no way I could have recognized him. He was talking like I was an old friend and tried to follow us around all night. Once I subtly alerted the others about who he was, we made every excuse in the book to try to leave, go back to our campsite, call it a night. He was painfully insistent on following us back and continuing to hang out. Obviously, I didn't want him to know where I slept, so... I tried to appease him by saying I was exhausted, but that we could try to meet up tomorrow. Again, dumb, I know. I was just doing anything I could to get him away in the moment and had no intention of actually following through. He finally left us alone and we walked a long roundabout way to our campsite just in case he had watched or tried to follow at a distance. The next day, I made an avid point to avoid the area where we ran into Eddie, discussed meeting up. The festival venue was huge, so I figured there was no way he'd find me again. I was behind a small stage in the back corner of the venue, hooping in the woods with my friends when I noticed him out of the corner of my eye. He was standing beside a tree alone, watching me with a weird smile. It reminded me of a proud dad watching his young daughter play, but with way creepier and more sinister overtones. Still, he hadn't done or said anything explicitly creepy or threatening, but his presence was so unsettling that I grabbed my friends and we pretended that we had forgotten about a set that was starting so we ran out of the wooded stage area. I remember hoping he didn't notice I had seen him. The festival ended the next day and I was relieved to not see him again. Fast forward about another year. At this point I barely used Facebook and had all but forgotten about Eddie. 
My friend that I went to the festival with was visiting from out of town that night and we were going to get some drinks. He got to my house and we were catching up and the subject of the festival came up. We started talking about Eddie and how weird that whole situation was, but at this point it was less creepy and more of just a strange memory. I told him Eddie used to message me all the time but that I had stopped opening them years ago. Naturally, my friend wanted to look through the messages, so I obliged. We began to scroll through the messages and I realized just how dire of a mistake it may have been not to block him. He had started by asking me what shows I was going to go to, what part of Atlanta I lived in, etc., not taking the hint that I clearly had no interest in responding at that point. Then, as the months went by, he was sending me links to tickets he had bought for me to shows in Atlanta, and then links to tickets he had bought for us to go together. There was one message asking where he could pick me up for a show that was two hours away in Athens, and that he couldn't wait to see me again. The messages continued to go on, but at this point I was so creeped out I immediately blocked him, finally, and closed the computer wide-eyed. He sounded like he was carrying on an entire relationship with me without my consent. He never acknowledged the fact that I literally hadn't responded to or even seen a message from him in over a year. Shaken up, we decided to just go get a drink and stop thinking about this weirdo. We get to Edgewood, a popular bar district in my city, and walk to our favorite small bar to get a drink. As soon as we walk into the bar, my heart sinks to the pit of my stomach. To this day, this was the creepiest and most coincidental moment that has ever happened. I see Eddie sitting at the far end of the bar. His face lights up as soon as I walk in, and he motions me over. He says something along the lines of, I can't believe it's you, and starts firing off questions about me, my life, what I've been up to, etc. At this point, the darkest feeling washes over me. I just feel unsafe and exposed. Why is he here? He doesn't even live in Georgia. I quickly tell him I have to use the restroom, but then I'll be back to the bar for a drink. I grab my friend, equally in shock, and we speed walk around the corner to the bathrooms and then past them. I will forever be grateful that the door to the patio area was just past the bathroom, so we got a head start. We get outside, hop the fence, and start running to my car. I glance behind us, and Eddie somehow figured out in those 15 seconds that we left, even though you can't see the bathrooms from where he was sitting, and he is walking rapidly across a crosswalk in our direction, eyes on me. We book it to my car and get out of Edgewood as quickly as we can. Shaken, I drive us around for about an hour before eventually going home to make sure we weren't being followed. As inconclusive as the whole thing was, that was the last time I ever saw Eddie, and I often wonder if this was just a string of coincidences or if it was more sinister. After all, he didn't live in Georgia. Why was he at one of my favorite bars alone? the night I happened to go through all his old messages. Had he somehow gotten a hold of my location via Facebook? I made sure all my location services were off when I checked my phone, so to this day, I have no idea how he ended up there or what his intentions were. This takes place in a fairly large city, roughly eight or so years ago. I'm female and at the time I was in my mid-twenties. There used to be a gay bar that did goth nights every Saturday night and I would head out there fairly often with my friends. This night there was a group of us, about five of us, that went together, plus we always ran into more people we knew once we got there. At some point I left my friends on the dance floor and went up to the bar to get another drink. It was pretty crowded so the only space I could squeeze into was next to some guy on a bar stool at the very end of the counter. I ordered my drink and he looked over and said hello. He had a pretty interesting accent, so I asked him where he was from. He replied that he was originally from Ethiopia. We made small talk as I was waiting for my drink and I commented that I had a neighbor as a child that was from Ethiopia as well. The exact details of the conversation are a bit hazy. It was years ago after all and to be fair I wasn't paying super close attention at the time so I'm not sure how the conversation went into this direction but I do remember his words snapping my brain's focus back onto him. I killed people there. Oh, well, 
I awkwardly chuckled, thinking maybe this was just some weird drunk guy thinking he would say weird, creepy things to the goth girl at the bar. Maybe it was his really bad attempt at flirting. My drink arrived, and I remember stirring it and trying to ease my way out of the conversation, but I was still waiting for my change. You used to kill people? He shook his head and replied casually, No, I still do. Uh-huh. My change could not arrive fast enough. I tried another awkward laugh and made some snarky comment about how I was fat and if he tried to kill me, I'd fight back and sit on him. I don't know. I mean, I have no idea what to say in this situation. Again, casually, without any emotion in his voice, he replied, There's no trying. If I decide to kill someone, I kill them. My change finally arrived and I took my drink which I had not let leave my hand or line of sight for an instant, excused myself and headed back over to my friends on the dance floor. I watched as he turned on his stool so he could keep an eye on me. He just sat there, sipping on his own drink, never looking away. Finally, at some point, I saw him put down his empty glass and move out the front door. I sighed in relief and continued on to enjoy my night. Several hours later, the goth night was ending and the next theme DJ was taking over. My friends and I were saying our goodbyes and I started walking to the front door. I turned around to see the friend that had given me a ride was stuck in a conversation with another acquaintance so I waited near the door just inside the building. That's when he grabbed me. The guy from the bar dragged me in farther into a dark corner out of line of the exit. I was in shock and couldn't make a sound at first as he pinned me to the wall, face pressed against it and he twisted one of my arms behind my back. It seemed like an eternity he had held me there, pushing himself up firmly behind me, almost like he was trying to hide me in even more shadows. There were no lights near us and no reason for anyone to walk by this corner. Even if I yelled, I wasn't sure if anyone would hear me since the DJ had started up. Somehow I managed to shove myself back against him once my flight instincts kicked in. In his surprise, his grip loosened just a bit and the angle he held me at relaxed and I managed to shove my fist directly into his manhood. I have no idea to this day how I actually bent myself around in just the right way, but he doubled over and I ran. I grabbed my friend out of her conversation and breathlessly gave a cliff note version of what happened as I dragged her to the back emergency exit. Before I could escape, I was stopped by security. He told me I couldn't go that way and had to leave through the front of the bar. I tried to explain to him that there was a guy up there that had tried to attack me but he wouldn't listen or just tuned it out or thought I was some drunk girl. Thankfully my friend and I managed to get the attention of a few other people we knew and we headed out the front as a group. I didn't see the guy anywhere but I was terrified of getting through the dark parking lot to the car. I just knew he would be out there hiding somewhere. My friend and I ran as fast as we could, dove into the car, and she pulled out of the parking space before I could even get my seatbelt on. Creeper dude was nowhere to be seen. I checked the news the next day to see if there had been any other attacks or, God forbid, murders in the area, but there was nothing. I don't really remember much of his features or what he was wearing or how he sounded, but I will never forget the emotionless, blank, matter-of-fact way he stated that he killed people and the way his dark eyes stared at me like I was prey. I work at a restaurant, and I love all the people I work with. Well, except one. The dishwasher, Jamal, is not my favorite. When I first started working there, I was one of two white girls. I say this because after the incident, my boss told me that Incidences similar to mine have occurred, but only with the younger white females. They've had to fire a good amount of people because of it, I guess. All these comments and gestures only happen to me and the other girl. Anyway, the cooks would flirt harmlessly and try to get things for me and help me. Jamal would flirt, but it would make my blood run cold. I would make small talk when I brought dishes back and he seemed okay. I couldn't tell if he had an intellectual disability or if he just naturally mumbled his words. I could make out about 50% of what he was saying most of the time. Well, after about three weeks of working there, I'm bringing dishes back. If there are crates for cups above the station, then you can't really see unless you look through the cracks of the grate. 
I looked through to try and see if the silverware was done. As I looked through, he moved right in my line of sight. He stared me dead in the eyes and started putting his tongue out and wiggling it like a snake. I was so creeped out. I couldn't tell anyone because when I thought of how to explain it, it just sounded funny or like a joke. I could tell it wasn't though. This went on about three months until yesterday. I was getting ready to leave work and was saying bye to my friend Derek who was working the dish pit with Jamal. Derek tends to flirt with me a lot and then just like that, Jamal was able to clearly pronounce his words. He said, Hey, would you be able to get me something? Didn't think it was odd except for the fact that he has never spoken clearly before, ever. But I said sure because most of the time dishwashers will ask one of us for a drink or something. He asked for a root beer float and I'm thinking, uh, kind of a weird request. Also, I really don't want to make that. I say, a root beer float? In a confused way. He then looks me dead in the eyes as he creepily does every day and says, yeah, a root beer float, but with you on top. I kind of laugh more like, oh my god. Derek is giving me a very confused look. Then Jamal says, mm-hmm. You on top with your legs spread wide open, and does the tongue thing again, then says, I think about you every time I see you. And then Derek is thoroughly creeped out and says, What are you doing? That is creepy, stop messing. And then Derek took his apron off and came out and kind of pushed me out of the kitchen. He asked me if I wanted him to get our manager, whose office is right next to the dish pit so I don't have to see Jamal again. I said no because I really, really did not want to tell my 6'4", like 275 pound boss this and probably start crying. Derek told me he would talk to him right after he walked me to my car and thank god he did. Jamal had left through the back and was smoking by the dumpster trying to act casual. Not an odd thing though as most employees do this. But when he saw Derek with me, he said something. But again he mumbled so no idea what he said but he threw his barely lit cigarette on the ground and walked back inside. Derek talked to our manager. They are going to talk to the general manager because he's the one that makes the decision to fire someone. Derek basically told my boss to fire him. My boss called me to check in on me and gave me the next three days off. They fired him because of harassment and... I have a feeling it wasn't his first strike. My ex-boyfriend used to work really late at a movie theater, like 1 or 2 a.m. frequently, so sometimes I would go see the late showing of a movie, then pick him up and give him a ride home with me. One night I had picked him up and we had gotten back to our neighborhood when I noticed that there was a car behind me that was taking all the same turns as I was. Being generally a fairly aware and or paranoid person, I thought it was suspicious but I figured I was being irrational so I ignored it. When this car turned onto my same street, it was even more weird, but when the car also flipped a loop at the end of my cul-de-sac, it was enough to make me not get out of my car, since my house was the only one on that part of the loop and he would have had no reason to make that turn like I did. When I pulled up to the curb, this car pulls in next to me and kind of at an angle, so he's blocking the front of my car. I'm scared at this point, but I'm obviously not getting out of that car, so... I just kind of sit there and see what's going to happen. The driver got out of their other car and opened his trunk and start rummaging around for a few minutes. Not sure what he's doing, just that he was digging in his trunk. Finally he stops and walks over to the window of my car and starts peeking in at us. Then he knocks on the window. I don't respond and don't open the window and he starts banging on the window. I have been beyond freaked out throughout this whole thing. But finally my brain kicks in and tells me that even though I'm parked on a loop and blocked in by his car in front, I can still throw my car in reverse and try to get out of there. Both of our cars were still running. As soon as I start reversing an inch, the guy sprints back to his car and hightails it out of there. I knew this wasn't a normal encounter, so I called the police and gave him a description of his car, which was unique because he had only one working headlight and a partial plate. They sent a cop out to see me, but it was clear to me that he didn't really believe me or was making light of the situation, which really bothered me. 
They never found him, and I have never heard anything about it. I honestly don't know what that man wanted. He could have wanted to carjack me, but that would have involved leaving his own car behind. Many other dastardly things could have been planned, and the situation could have gone much worse, but I was still terrified. Yesterday I took my dog to the park as I normally do. It was a cold but sunny day, so when I got there about half the parking lot was full. However, everyone seemed to be leaving. As we were walking toward the wooded part of the park, I noticed a guy dressed in all black with big sunglasses and a huge handkerchief covering his face. Kind of gave me the creeps, but I ignored him. When we were halfway through the park, I heard a man yelling and I couldn't see anyone. My dog was standing very alert and growling, and I turned around and the man I saw earlier was standing right behind me. Hey. Excuse me? Move your car. Mine? Yeah. Move your car. Is there something wrong with it? You park way too close to me, and there's an empty parking lot. At this point, I'm just confused and a little scared by this guy's tone. I told him it wasn't empty when I got there, but I was happy to move it because I didn't want to anger him any more than he already was. He followed me and walked behind me muttering cuss words and insults. Then he said, You're so lucky I found you. I have a crowbar in my car and I was going to smash your windows and slash your tires. Then I was going to find you and smash your head in. But I'm having a good day today. I'm in a really good mood. It's just... Girls like you, they ruin things. I had my mace in my hand and my knife in the other. We kept walking towards the parking lot, but he just kept getting angrier. He screamed at me. Are you going to apologize? I told him I was sorry and that I hope he has a better day. He said, Better day? I'm having a great day. You're alive, aren't you? I started to walk faster and so did he. I made a full sprint to my car and the guy just stopped and watched me laughing. He started throwing sticks and rocks in my car while laughing as I drove off. I filed a police report. I don't know if he was just trying to scare me or what, but I hope he doesn't actually hurt someone in the future. I was about 13 years old, lived in a quiet, rural lake community. My parents, aunt and uncle, were going away for the weekend, so my cousin, who was 15, stayed over at my house for the weekend. He brought over his Xbox and a bunch of games, and we stayed up all night playing and chilling in my room. My room was small with a single twin bed, so we ended up sleeping downstairs on the set of couches in the finished basement. I get woken up by my husky at around 8am. She was acting like she needed to go out, but... This was strange for her to do. I rubbed my eyes, still half asleep, and started up the stairs to let her out. When I grabbed the doorknob, to my surprise, the door pulled right open. As groggy and dumb as I was, I think to myself, weird, the knob must be broken. I open the door, clip the dog on her lead, but she won't go out. I coax her out, annoyed because I got only a couple of hours of sleep, and when I turn to go back inside, I notice the jam is completely destroyed. That's when everything hit me. I have no idea what to do. My cousin is still asleep in the basement. I don't have a cell phone. Are they still in my house? I quietly listen for any kind of movement, then get back down to the basement and wake my cousin up. We stupidly decide to go up and look through the house. Thank God it was empty. Also empty of all our video games, movies, valuables, etc. I call 911 and then my parents. Police arrive, don't do much of anything except say, tough luck. It took me a few hours to settle down when I finally realized the fact that this person or people who presumably knew my parents left on vacation, but perhaps not that I didn't go with them, watched me while I slept. Had we stayed in my small room with the creaky door, I almost certainly would have woken up and faced the intruders. My life could have been very different, and this still gives me chills 16 years later. I 
been lurking for a while and thought I'd share one of my own stories. Definitely not as scary as the some I've seen, but it was one of those occasions where you know things would have turned out poorly if you made the wrong decision. At the time of this incident, I was 17 years old and on the way to a job interview in town at a large retail company. I was excited as it was only my second job and would be weekend work for me to continue my studies at sixth form as I wanted to go on to uni. The interview was a Tuesday morning in the spring so it was nice warm weather and fairly quiet out. I didn't have classes that day and was dressed in a smart dress with tights despite the warm weather and a cardigan. The dress on itself wasn't revealing. It reached mid-thigh but did show a fair bit of cleavage and I had always had quite large breasts so I was used to men looking even if it made me feel uncomfortable. I was also wearing high-heeled shoes. All in all, I looked older than 17. My mom was going to work so couldn't drive me all the way to my interview but gave me a lift halfway there before she turned off in the direction she needed to go. When I got out of the car, I had my phone in my hand and was texting my friend to remind her what time I'd be finished in my interview so we could meet up afterward. There weren't many people out, lots of cars, work vans, but at the bus stop, there was only myself, a middle-aged Pakistani man, and a couple of younger mums chatting with their babies and buggies. I ignored everyone else as I waited for the bus, but eventually the man walked over to me. At first, he just said hi and asked me the time, but quickly the conversation began to make me feel uncomfortable. He complimented my outfit, told me I was beautiful, and kept talking about how my dress made my figure look. He was particularly interested in my breasts. I was always very shy, but my parents encouraged good manners, so I never spoke unless I was asked a question, and I didn't really know how to get myself out of the situation. I know now that neither my parents would have minded me telling this man to screw off, but oh well. Lessons learned. I told him I was 17, that I was going for an interview and I was hoping to get into uni next year. He kept asking me questions and I'm getting steadily more unnerved by them. He goes on to tell me that someone as beautiful as me, I'm 5'3", slightly overweight, wear glasses and have never once been called beautiful by anyone outside my family, shouldn't be going to work. He says he can get me whatever I want and I never have to lift a finger. I just laugh him off and make a point of looking at my phone and typing out a long text to my friend who just wished me luck. He's reading over my shoulder and I keep trying to turn away but he's having none of it so eventually I put the phone in my bag. I decide to ignore him as his questions and suggestions get ever more creepy. He's asking me now to come with him to London where he's going for a party and that his friends will love me and they'd buy me lots of pretty clothes and I could drink whatever I wanted. I tell him I don't drink and I'm not going to London. He keeps insisting and I lose my temper a bit and tell him that I've been waiting for a job interview for months and I have no intention of going anywhere but to get a job. He keeps insisting I don't need the money, he'll give me everything I want. He's even going to pay my ticket to London. I again tell him no and finally the bus comes. To my dismay it's practically empty and the only people on it are a few elderly people all sat together. I sit as close to the front as I can knowing full well he's going to sit beside me but make sure I'm sat near the buggy area where the other two mums from the bus stop will have to sit. Of course he gets on the bus, squashes me into the window so I'm stuck between him and the glass and he's talking non-stop. At one point I spin a lie about not going away with him for the weekend because my brother just got released from prison and we're having a welcoming home party. He looks confused but it doesn't have the desired effect of making him leave me alone. I naively thought having a relative in prison would be an off-putting thing to learn. He has sat with his hand on my thigh for most of the ride. I tried to ask him to move it, but he wouldn't and I didn't really know what to do, so I ignored it. He asked me for my number and I said no, so he kept asking and pouting at me like he thought that that would make me change my mind. I told him again no, so he writes his number on a ripped piece of newspaper and hands it to me and asks me to call him. I lie and say I will but he insists I do it now. I said I didn't have credit and he reminded me he'd seen me texting so I said as plainly as I could, getting bolder the more scared I was getting, I'm not giving you my number, I'm not going with you to a party and I'm not interested in talking to you, please leave me alone. 
I say it loud enough that the two mums and the nearby elderly people suddenly look up and watch us. I try to indicate to them that I needed help, but they go back to their own conversations. Eventually, we get to the stop he needs to get off at to walk to the station, and he stands up and looks at me. Here, we need to get off at this stop. He holds out his hand to me. Of course, I don't take it, and I don't stand up. No. We need to get off. You're going to make us miss the train. I already told you I don't want to go to London. I don't know you. I'm going to my job interview. Sarah, I mean it. Stop messing around and get up. The people in the bus are now looking at us, and the bus driver turns around and asks if the man is getting off. Yeah, I am. My girlfriend is just messing around. Women, eh? Or something to that effect. He's trying to laugh it off, but the bus driver seems to realize something's amiss. I'm not his girlfriend. My name isn't Sarah, and I have no idea who he is. The driver starts opening his cab to get out, but the man growls something incoherent and gets off the bus. The doors are closed behind him, and the man pulls out his phone and has an angry conversation with someone whilst the driver and shocked passengers ask if I'm okay. The police are called, but... I don't speak to them as the driver had to move the bus as he was holding up traffic on a one-lane road. I was never contacted afterward about the incident and I didn't see the man again. When I got off at the stop I needed the driver to ask me again if I was okay and told me he'd pass on the information to the police. At the time I thought he was just a creep who couldn't take no for an answer. I now work in children's services and I understand how human trafficking works. They target vulnerable girls and try to coax them away with compliments, promises of money, nice things, and alcohol. Fortunately for me, I was not as vulnerable as clearly I looked, and despite being shy and non-confrontational, I wasn't willing to do something I didn't want to do. I have no doubt as to what would have happened if I'd gotten off the bus with him voluntarily. I ended up getting the job. I was early enough, I had time to cry down the phone to my mom, and then my dad and calmed down before going in. I worked there for about four years, so all's well that ends well. I'm a 24-year-old male who was born and raised in northern New England. I grew up hearing all the scary stories and urban legends that haunted my dreams, but there was one local legend that everyone in my high school knew about. Monkey Town. Monkey Town was supposed to be a Christian retreat camp. You'd have to take this road in between a funeral home and a cemetery down this big hill, and you'd enter what looks like the set from The Village, 2004. It was a big circle of old-style houses with a big white church in the middle. I'll describe it more later in the story, but... It was always a dare to see how far you could walk down into the camp without chickening out. I remember a couple of times in middle school a few friends and I made it halfway down the hill and definitely did that, chicken out. The year was 2011, junior year. I had just gotten my license and my first car, a classic Chevy Blazer. One night I was driving around with two friends, one who went to the same high school as me, let's call her Bessie, and one who didn't, Kale. Bessie and I thought it might be funny to take Kale down to Monkey Town to see what happens, so the three of us hopped in my blazer and there we went. I remember putting on some of the instrumental music from Halloween, the 1978 version, to set the mood, and how dumb was I? As we got down the hill, mind you we were in my car the entire time, we made our way around the circle, mesmerized by this entire community separated from society. One thing that stuck out was this red light at the top of the church's steeple. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. That's when I remember thinking, no way. I quickly turn my head to my left and see a giant man in overalls running full speed towards my car. The most messed up part about this man is he was carrying a bat or tool of some sort. I didn't even think. I slammed on the gas and we got out of there. The three of us couldn't believe what had just happened. I'm pretty sure we just went back to my house to recover from the scare. We passed out and all was well. The next day I was chilling with another friend, James and his girlfriend Sadie. I had told them about last night's events and they, sure enough, didn't buy it. Me, a 17-year-old teenage boy, wanted to prove them wrong, 
so we all jumped into my blazer and headed back to Monkey Town. This time, my blazer was full and we had picked up two other girls who coincidentally had the same name and another buddy of mine, Joe. I made James drive my blazer and I sat shotgun. As we all headed down, the tension rose. We got halfway around the circle until one of the girls started screaming. This time, there were at least five men running at my car and three of them definitely had weapons. James didn't know what to do. It's like he froze. The men were all yelling to get out of the car. They were legitimately shaking my car back and forth. I remember being crouched down so far in the seat as if that did anything. Finally, James slammed on the gas and peeled out of there. As we calmed down and I began taking all my friends home, I got a call from my mom. Apparently, two police officers were in my kitchen. One of the Monkey Town civilians had called the police and told them we tried to run them over. It's complete nonsense, and I was furious. We raced to my house to explain to the officers what actually happened. All in all, the cops didn't seem too interested, and no crime was committed. To this day, I can't help but think what would have happened if we had gotten out of the car. What kind of Christian retreat camp is that? I'm an 18-year-old female living in a small town in Michigan. When this incident took place, I had been working a few hours a week in a small pizzeria. It was in my town, and I had been working there for about a year when my boss decided to go on vacation. She and her family lived in an apartment below the restaurant, and two other apartments were overhead. In order to get into these apartments, you had to go to the back of the building and down a sketchy set of stairs or the grass slope where you would find her door and the stairs leading up to the apartments above. Beyond that, there is a yard and then some woods. I think it's important to mention that there was absolutely no reason to be behind the restaurant unless you were trying to enter the apartments. Now, I usually work with my mom because we got stuff done easily and I hate answering phones. One night, my mom was feeling ill, so I had to go to work with another lady. She was very sweet, but not super efficient, so I was working hard to keep up and getting a bit agitated when she told me that we needed parmesan. I agreed to go get it from the store just down the road if she promised not to make me answer phones for the rest of our shift. There was only about two hours left, which was normal and pretty slow, so I guess it didn't matter that much anyways. As I was getting in my SUV, I saw a guy pull in the small parking lot with a beat-up car and park near the back. He was lanky and wearing oil-stained shop clothes, which was and still is totally normal around here. He got out and retrieved a bag from his trunk and headed down the slope. I know this guy wasn't a renter because I'd never seen him before, and the renters frequently ordered pizza. It was possible he was a friend of one of the renters, but that didn't seem right. It was 9.30 at night and one renter was a single mom and the others were two brothers with mental health issues that were pretty antisocial. I was getting bad vibes so I grabbed my knife from the center console and tucked it up my sleeve. Call me paranoid but there had been a lot of car fires and break-ins around that time so I was nervous to go anywhere unarmed. It might have been a stupid thing to do, but I considered my boss a friend and didn't want this guy to hurt any of the renters or steal from any of the apartments. I decided to go see what he was doing just in case he had any ill intentions. I got out of my car and walked quietly to the slope. There was motion-activated lights so I could easily see what he was doing. He was fiddling with an old key ring and trying to get into my boss's apartment. What are you doing? I asked loudly so that my coworker could hopefully hear me through the open back door. He was startled but smiled and told me he worked for my boss's husband and was there to feed the dog and let it out. His smile was creepy, the kind that a liar gives when they're trying really hard to convince you. My boss did have a dog and her husband did own a fabrication shop so his story seemed to check out but I was still not convinced. I decided to go get the cheese and check again when I got back. Okay, let me know if you need any help with anything. I tried to sound as normal as possible, but I was seriously creeped out. I hustled at the store and back to work. I'd been gone only 15 minutes when I got back and, surprisingly, he was already gone. 
I was still feeling suspicious and bad for the dog who'd been shut in a good portion of the day, so I decided to text my boss when I got out of work. Fast forward two hours and I was on my way home. I got to my door when I decided to check Facebook. As I was scrolling, I saw something that made my stomach drop. It was a picture of my boss with her dog on the beach from earlier that day. I called my boss and then the police to make a report. It turned out the guy had been fired by my boss's husband earlier that week for making an inappropriate comment about his 19-year-old daughter and repeatedly harassing other female staff. This guy had planned some sort of revenge scheme but didn't know they had left for vacation. His bag was full of tools and a couple of knives. During questioning, he told them that the only reason he left was because he thought I was watching him. Thankfully, he went to jail for that and a couple of other things he had been wanted for previously. This still creeps me out to this day and I hate to think what would have happened if they had been home. I worked in a residential care facility. For a number of years, I worked with a woman named Kajiri. She was generally okay to work with, but she could be... intense. Sort of a joking flirtation that often finds its way into high-pressure environments was common throughout the whole team, but when she directed it at me, it didn't seem so jokey. It took me forever to realize that because I usually don't notice someone flirting with me until someone else points it out six months later. But when she started trying to give me jewelry and chocolate bouquets, I finally caught a clue. In between things being normal and actually maybe not really normal, there was a long escalation of text messages, comments that made me feel uncomfortable, personal space violations, dropping by my house uninvited, hanging around on my shift hours after hers had finished, unwanted touching, etc. As mentioned, I can be slow to catch on. Once I realized what was happening, I put as much distance between us as possible, stopped answering calls and texts, locked down social media, spoke to other colleagues and had them running interference. A lot of interference, actually. At the time, it kind of became a joke, but looking back, it was all kinds of messed up. She even parked outside my house sometimes and I'd sit in the back room with the light off so she'd think I wasn't home. Honestly, 2018 me is looking back at 2016 me, throwing popcorn and screaming, do something you stupid cow, but hey, 2016 me was alarmingly chill. After a couple of months of my disappearing woman act, she seemed to get the hint and backed right off. I was pleased. We all got on with our lives and lived happily ever after. Not quite. A few months after it died down, I heard through the grapevine that Kajiri seemed to have focused her attentions on another co-worker, Linda. Linda and I had a close mutual friend but didn't know each other well. I didn't think much of it beyond, good luck you poor idiot, bad 2016 me, bad. A few months later again and I get a call out of the blue from a mutual friend Linda and I share. Without preamble, he asked, were you dating Kajiri? Uh, no. I was shocked. He had been privy to all the awkward details of my experience with Kajiri and had helped run interference. He explained that he had been talking to Linda and she'd asked about my relationship with Kajiri. The story that followed still sounds too fantastical to have actually happened in an actual sensible grown-up workplace. Kajiri had been catfishing her own best friend Amanda, posing as Linda. In a string of emails, Linda and Amanda had discussed Kajiri's drug problem her abusive and dangerous ex, none other than yours truly, Linda coming out to her family after her brother caught her in bed with Kajiri and more. The jig was up when Linda got a second job, coincidentally with Amanda's husband who mentioned how great it was to finally meet Kajiri's girlfriend, which puzzled poor straight single Linda. Some highlights of the story Kajira had been telling to Linda, her friends and other co-workers I wasn't close to she picked her audience very carefully, that Linda and I had physically fought at work over Kajiri, that two male co-workers Kajiri and I did some pretty questionable things in the staff office on a night shift, that Kajiri and I had broken up after I cheated on her with another male co-worker, that I would drug her against her will, and that we had planned to have children using a sperm donor but 
that I had miscarried. This woman had been living out a full-on soap opera and using her co-workers and her friends as set pieces. Linda and I reported her to management and she was immediately suspended pending investigation. She quit two days later. Unfortunately, HR decided they needed to continue their investigation of the allegation that I did those questionable things at work with a group of people. Because that was totally plausible and not at all made up by a crazy woman, right? I left that job a month later myself and when I interviewed for my current job, she had interviewed half an hour before me and they were looking to hire two people. She didn't get the job, but there have been two other openings since and she applied for both of them. I'm terrified of meeting her again. It turned out she has a history of inpatient psych treatment for delusional behavior and was known to be obsessive about people she took a liking to. According to Facebook, her current girlfriend, real, not real, me, who knows, has a similar first name as me and shares more than a few physical similarities. She still knows where I live. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. Make some friends. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merchandise on Spreadshirt.com. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.